Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. All right, we're live here at the Total Archery Challenge, and I have Greg Litzinger here with me. Did I pronounce that correctly? Correct. Awesome. Very correct. So, uh, welcome again to the East Meets West Hunt Podcast, and recording live here at the Total Archery Challenge from our booth, and it's a nice sunny day in Pennsylvania. Yeah, it's great. Uh, so much for that rain and cold weather, because it was hot today, muggy, nasty. Yes, it was. <laughs> It was, and I'm just glad it what didn't, the wind didn't kick up, uh, you know, blow your tent away. Yeah, because <laughs> of course I forgot uh, sandbags there to tie down the tent. Yeah, it's a learning experience, you know. Yeah, it's like hunting. <laughs> exactly, just just keep improving, right? Yeah, or, or maybe hopefully quit forgetting things. Yeah. But <laughs> so, anyways, uh, Greg, so I I met you last night here, but um, I had. Uh, actually went through the train to hunt with you last year in Pennsylvania and everything, but didn't know you at the time. And you seem to have, uh, you seem to have some experience similar to mine. And, uh, we got along pretty good last yeah. night. So I asked you to yeah, very on smooth the podcast here. So, so for our second date, I'd like to, yeah. you know, <laughs> get into this. We're going big time. We're going big time. We're going to sit here and talk. So, and people watch. This is great. Yes, it is. It's nice. We got people staring at us as yeah, we're sitting we're here. We're important. Yeah, yeah. That's what you got to pretend. Yeah. Pretend it's you're somebody. Back like, what's up? Yeah, yeah. We're sitting here. We're podcasting. So, <laughs> anyways, yeah. So to to get into it here, Greg. So tell us a little bit about yourself and who you are and what you do. Uh, yeah, you know, lifelong you know hunter. Basically, my dad was a hunter, so outdoorsman, hunting, fishing, camping. Uh, just got hooked on bow hunting and at a young age just shooting a bow and then once I started bow hunting you know at 14 it was just I don't know I can't explain it like I pretty much almost stopped fishing you know and pretty much focused on bow hunting just that connection being in the woods and you know those things you take for granted now like because I look at how I was when I was 14 and those little moments you don't take pictures you don't do anything like now you I, I record everything because I don't want to miss things that you missed yeah. You know, but it's uh, I've just been traveling here and there, uh, bow hunting, shooting the bow, compete, uh, worked in archery shops. You know, we got a lot of similarities, you and I. Yeah. Uh, you know, just enjoy everything about, you know, archery. Um, I didn't necessarily walk away from archery uh, or hunting, but I got into snowboarding in my 20s, and I did that. That was the majority of my time uh, with snowboarding, traveling out west and doing all that good stuff. And that's where I think I got addicted to the mountains, going out to Oregon, Tahoe, you know, Colorado, all these just massive mountains and seeing different random animals. And it's like, this is pretty cool. And then injury bug strikes. And next thing you know, all that focus that I had, I took from snowboarding and went right into hunting and archery. And it's just probably, uh, it's probably a good thing, I guess, these injuries happened. Yeah. <laughs> Cause they put me back, you know, where I, I should be, you know, like, uh, you know, I just love being in the woods, just being outside. Yeah, and uh, you definitely went uh, head first into that from the yeah. from the sounds <laughs> of it here, and um, and you're you're really big into, or or at least you were into competitive shooting. Still do. Yeah, you still, still do. Yeah, okay. I placed uh, third this year in Delaware. Um, little upset over that one. I should have been first, but <laughs> yeah, it's easy know. to to pick apart yourself. Yeah, there, right? it's like uh, well, you, I mean, you know, you get the bounce outs. I had like three bounce outs and. It's not much, just, you know, they were X's and turned into X's, turned into eights. So there's, you mm -hmm. know, points you don't get. Like, I'm happy with how I shot, but third when I should have been first is a, doesn't, doesn't sit well. No, 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 no. I'm too competitive, <laughs> you know, because I shot extremely well and the score doesn't reflect it, but, you know, but I did shot, I mean, it was crazy windy. I mean, like today, and I was just had one of those days where I couldn't do no wrong. So I was happy. Awesome. And then I hit, come here today and, <laughs> it's a long day fun fun long day yeah <laughs> how would you describe this course <laughs> uh if you don't shoot over 100 yards 
all the time. These cor- the Western course can be a long day. <laughs> yeah, a lot of arrows, a lot yes. of arrow sales for the vendors yeah, here. Exactly. You know, uh, I got you know, started with twelve arrows, came home with twelve, so that's a plus. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, there's that. That's a win in my yeah. book. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've ever, you yeah. know, came to the to the total archery challenge without losing at least half my arrows. <laughs> yeah, Rick found one. I was like, oh sweet, he found one. He found it, you know. <laughs> but it's a, it's one of those things. I mean, you with anything, you, you get what you get out, what you put in. Yeah. You know, if you if you shoot thirty yards, I mean, I don't want to turn anybody away from this, but it, you don't belong out there. Because you're going to get frustrated, you're going to start making mistakes or beat yourself up probably mm-hmm. and blame the bow, person, you. And it it could be rough for a lot of people. You know, like I know how to handle not shooting well. And like and today was rough for me, like trying to keep my focus and put the best positive spin on it. Because these events, you can pick up bad habits real fast. Oh, yeah. Real fast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's for sure. And uh, the the one thing though is if you are you know somewhat prepared for it, it can help you with those d- yes. difficult angles and in real life scenarios with the logs blocking yep. the vitals oh, and, and <laughs> Rob. <laughs> Good job sending the course up, buddy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks, Rob. Man. Yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> you're uh, you're the cause of a, a yeah. lot of money in arrow sales. That's yeah. for, that's for sure. A but of, a lot of full metal jackets today on the course. Was there? A lot, of, a lot of the money lost in those. I've probably seen a dozen or so snapped in half. It's like, <laughs> I thought they were like indestructible. <laughs> Guess not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the biggest thing. I, I mean, I've found over the last few years with this event is just one, you, you figure out stuff with your equipment. So if your, your third axis is out, you're going to mm-hmm. know pretty quick yep, when you're shooting fast. them downhills and, and steep uphills on the, on the slope. So um, just the, the fatigue factor, like the prime, especially they're, like you're walking in the, you know, we didn't have, it was kind of like now, it's uh, somewhat sunny, humid. Yeah. I mean, them last couple of targets, you're, I'm not exactly out of shape, but I'm somewhat in shape and I was tired, you know, and yeah. carrying your bow and your gear, backpacks, it, it, it does drain on you physically, which is good for like the hunting scenario. You'll be like, you know, if you're chasing an elk, you know, a couple thousand yards in the mountains. Yeah. And that moment arises, I mean, this is. Yeah, it can definitely help you out in those uh, scenarios. Yeah. I definitely see where I need to work on my distance shooting like I did last year. I worked on my distance shooting last year, and I shot great, mm-hmm. you know, 120-yard bombs and you know, everything else. This year, not so much. <laughs> yeah. the mount, Yeah, the mountain ops course, I crushed that thing. That was like more my home turf, you know, in the woods, 40, 50-yard shots. That was great. Yeah. I was cr- you know, lighting those targets up, you know. But uh, like I said, it's, you get what you put in. Yeah, it's all fun. Like yeah. you said, shooting with your good buddies out here, yep. and, and and like uh, said, and it's just you, know, you you see guys that do get frustrated, and like you feel bad for them, you know. Mm-hmm. Like even on the practice range, guys are getting frustrated because that practice range is no joke. No. Uphill. I mean, you're going straight uphill. It's like a, that's got to be what forty five. A uh, forty degree angle pitch, yeah. Like shooting uphill, nobody has that. In their back. I don't have that in my backyard. I'm flat land, so it's like <laughs> yeah, here. Uh, whoa, that 90 yards way up there. That <laughs> throws everything all off, you know? Yeah. But still good, you know? Yeah, exactly. And that, that that's that's the thing. It's so different from shooting in your backyard. And, and you know, definitely correlates to whether you're hunting, like you were talking to me last night about, you know, northern New Jersey and some of that has some pretty hilly terrain and Pennsylvania. And then the other extreme is, you know, going out west to the Rocky Mountains. But you're shooting in your bl- backyard on flat ground all the time. Yep. You're going to be in for rude awakening with yeah, yeah. These all these events, uh, this event, you know, the train to hunts and all the other things that are out there that they do can make you a better hunter. Yeah. You know, and for years I, I looked, I scoffed at that stuff, but it does does pay off. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But you just gotta you gotta want it to pay off. You know, like you gotta <laughs> want to put in that work to get good. Yep. You know, like I came here my first year and. I lost one arrow, and, you know, it was just rainy, nasty. But I worked twice as hard because I knew what was I was in store for, you know? Mm-hmm. And then this year, I was just like, yeah, I'll be good enough. And, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh-huh. good enough. <laughs> yeah. Good enough. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Period. Yeah. <laughs> Period. And dot. Next. <laughs> Next. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So, anyways, um, Greg, 
So you uh, were telling me again last night when we were talking, uh, we should have just recorded that because that, yeah. was, a, that was a beautiful conversation, yeah. but uh, about your first trip out west, Jason Elk, this year, yeah. and and you kind of you kind of had me in tears laughing yeah. at some, some of the was, experiences. Yeah, it was, uh, I said my buddy Rick, you know, muscles over there. <laughs> uh, we just went out, lifelong dream. You know, we always talked about it, and finally it was, we both turned 40 and we're, we're going to do it. Yeah. You know, so, and... It, for not knowing anything about elk, you know, I, don't, I still don't know how to bugle. I don't even own a bugle. Yeah. I took a cow call out there. Yeah. Uh, I tried bugling a few times, a few times. I was like, nah, that's, I'll just stick with the cow calls because that seems to work. And, uh, they said we were on elk. I mean, first night we had bulls screaming. And if you've never been, I've never heard of elk bugle in real life until that first night there. And it was a, such a weird, awesome feeling. You know, when I heard it, it was like your first, hearing your first turkey gobble almost. Yeah. You're hunting, you're just like, what, what now? Like, I remember we're like six yards apart, and the, the bull's bugling. We both look at each other, what now? It's like, I don't know. I've never been here before. It's like, what should we do? I was like, I, I really don't know. I was like, run here. And we're like we're running back and forth. We don't know what to do because <laughs> we're panicking because one bugle, next thing we get uh, a few more bugling, and we're like, um, do we go down? Do we stay here? Do we, you know, and basically we're like just running around in circles for what seemed like five minutes was probably only five seconds, but <laughs> we got all our stuff together and and uh they said Ricky got within you know fifty yards, but like we were saying last night, there's so many blowdowns and deadfalls. I mean, that bull was fifty yards. First night ever elk hunting. I mean, first night and fifty yards and he just couldn't get a shot. He was moving too fast. And I stayed back and in hindsight I should have, you know, just followed him down. Should have went down the ridge. Yep. And uh yeah, lesson learned. Hindsight's you know. always twenty twenty, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, but it was just that cool, you know, hearing them bugle from that deep guttural bugle. You know, you can see it in the, you know, you see it in the videos where the, the snot and everything's coming out of their mouth. Like, that's what I envisioned. And yeah. they were just all over the place. It was such a, a, an awesome feeling. We had a great sunset and just bulls everywhere. And, uh, you know, we had high hopes for next morning, had some bugles next morning. I had some more less that evening, and it kind of tapered off. And then, you know, pretty much that was the end of the bugles. Yeah. You know, and come to find out somebody was in the valleys below, you know, burning through those things every every morning, you know, mm -hmm. when we were there. So, you know, there again, you don't know what's below you or, or above you when you're out there, you know? Oh, yeah. And so for, was it everything that, as far as the expectations that you, you thought it would be, you know, from coming from New Jersey to head all the way across the United States to 30 hours. Yeah. A completely <laughs> different environment. And it's, it's overwhelming at yeah. first, you know, and the, um, and the first day up there, like, uh, cause, I mean, cause I got knee problems, you know, four knee surgeries. So sitting in a car stinks for me. It hurts my knees. I get some fluid in the ankles, mm -hmm. but the first night there, I mean, the first on the, on the hike up, we literally had to stop, you know, um, an hour in because I couldn't feel my feet. My feet were so swelled up. And I'm like, so I just loosened the boots the best I could. And me and Ricky got a little, you know, tit for tat, you know, because he wants to go up. I'm like, I can't go up. My feet hurt. Leave me alone. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to side hill. I was like, we got GPS coordinates. I'll meet you up there. I'm, we're not splitting up. I'm like, listen, dude, I'm trying my best here. <laughs> I'm in a lot of pain. Like, <laughs> I mean, it hurt. My feet just hurt. And I loosened the boots up to the point. It was like, they weren't even laced up, you know, and it just, as of, you know, that evening it, it got better, but I mean, it was foot cramps. I mean, both feet were just like, this is my first, this is what I've been waiting for, training for, for the past 18 months. And I'm not even going to make it up the hill the first night. I was like, I'm just going to stay here. I'm just hunt low, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, and that, I mean, that got my, in my head a little bit, you know, cause it was like, man, all this effort, time and money. And here I am and I can't, and I, I don't know if I just willed myself out of that, you know, moment, but you know, it, it was just entertaining. You know, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. You know, me and Ricky, we've been hunting together since we've been 14 years old. Yeah. You know, we both killed a first deer with one another. So to have him there, you know, just experiencing all that stuff was, was pretty gnarly. And the fact that, you know, he almost shot a bull and a cow. You know, he had long, you know, uh, spikes in range, but he can't shoot spikes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had like the worst luck. You know, I'm filling up the, <laughs> filling up my water flask that one day. I hear some sticks crack and look up and there's just a herd of elk just looking right at me like 50 yards. I'm like, really? This is what you're going to do to me? And that was pretty much my my whole week. You know, it should have, would have, could have. Yeah, know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's that's the way it goes, too. Yeah. And, but, and just 
and it was a high pressure area. You know, a lot of a lot of hunters, a lot of road hunters. Were you and, in Montana? You said yeah. Okay, uh, right out, right near Helena. Okay, Hel- Helena, Helena. What do you think? Yeah, Hel- I don't. Know. I don't know. I'm not from Montana either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some people might get offended. Yeah. Sorry, uh, West Montanians. Yeah, West West people. My, my West friends. <laughs> and uh, but just to have elk and chances in you know 50 yards is definitely in the wheelhouse for us mm-hmm. uh, on numerous occasions. That's a success in itself because there's guys that go out there three years. Those guys go out there with guides that don't run an elk like that. Yeah. So, you know, I'm I'm pretty happy about that. You know, I'd be happier if we killed something, but next yeah. time. Yeah, nice time. But, yeah. Do you plan on doing it again? 2019. Yeah, 20. Tim, you know, we're going to do the mule, get mule deer tags too because I was cheap and didn't buy one and had 150 caliber inch mule deer stand up 40 yards away from me. And I'm saying, yep, I'm cheap. Didn't want to spend 180 bucks. Uh, yep. And, yeah. I, and I'm going home with the yeah. meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's funny. It, uh, what, out of that um, experience, what would you change from whether it's a gear perspective or uh, uh, you know from a mental, physical, anything from that side of things? Gear, gear perspective, my clothes. Like uh, I took uh, scree gear out there, mm-hmm. and their pants are. I, I mean, we had every type of weather. Like the, their gear performed great. I didn't have a problem with that. Mm-hmm. Boots be a little bit different. I'd probably go with uh, Solomon boots. Okay, I went with uh, you know, European style leather hikers. Yeah, and. Uh, when it was hot, those things were just, you know, tearing my feet up. You know, when it, when it got cold there toward the end of the week, they were great. But, yeah, you know, the first three or four days was brutal in those things. Just a, just a sweat factor. Okay. Um, and swelling didn't take into consider, consideration swelling, you know. So oh, yeah. Those, those narrow boots, they're great. Side hill was traction was great, but just I need something a little bit wider in the toe box. So then, were they kind of, uh, were they more like a mountaineering type boot? Yeah. Like a real yeah. stiff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, they were uh, Mendel boots. Okay. Gotcha. Um, uh, my buddy worked at Cabela's and got a solid deal on them for me. Yeah. So I can't complain. You know, the boots performed as expected, just not. As not for you. Yes. For your yeah. feet. And that's, yeah. boots are like the, you know, they're they're very hard. And especially living where we do, yeah. to find boots to try on for something like that is and they not cheap. easy. No. They're not cheap. You know, like. Yeah, if I would have bought those boots full price, you know, it would have been like 300 bucks or something. Yeah. You know, to realize, like, they stink. And it's like, well, that's 300 bucks wasted because we can sell them for 100 bucks. Yeah, you yeah. Know? But that the boot thing is it's like a, like we were talking last night, Bose. It's, it's a matter of personal preference. You're yeah. going to spend money to find something that works. There's no way around it. Yep. Sometimes you get lucky, but odds are you're not. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And uh, pack, pack was good. Um, the bivy sack and tarp. Tarp, great. But I definitely want to bring uh, a, a a full size tent because it was some a lot of bugs, a lot of ants. Yeah. And a bivy sack. If anybody's ever been in a bivy, yeah, I don't care what type of venting you got. It's hot. You sweat. It's clingy. It's nasty. Yeah. And you're pretty much just hot boxing yourself every night to sleep because the bugs are so bad. You know, so it wasn't wasn't fun. But the tarp was a good idea. Um, but definitely have a tent to go under the tarp. Because yeah. tarp couldn't keep your gear dry, you know. We had a couple of rain there for a day, and you know my gear stayed dry. I was in the in the bivy where like, you know, Rick brought a small two man tent. He had to put all his wet gear pretty much inside the tent. Yeah, you know, I'm like, mm, nope, I'm good. You know? Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just food too, and that's different. You know, you got to try. Like I, we packed almost four thousand calories a day. I probably ate half of that. Yeah, and I felt fine. You know. I got hungry. I ate like um, I listened. I tried to listen to a lot of people. I'd rather have too much than not enough, but I definitely packed way too much food. Yeah, like, I literally came in with two full days worth of food on a five day trip. Yeah, because I was just like I'm not hungry. You know, I'm not going to force myself to eat. You know, or I'd rather be looking for elk than eating. Yeah, <laughs> no. I'll eat at night or eat lunch, eat breakfast, and you know, a quick little uh, snack. But um, I didn't want to be tied down from you know eating every two or three hours. Yeah, like I said, five days. Six days, maybe a two-week trip. I'd take nutrition a little bit differently because yeah. you can grind down after two weeks. But five days, I think you can just tough it out. You know, worst-case scenario, you know, yeah. you, 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 you're tired, you eat. You know, a lot, of, a lot of people that I talk to, they they got real big into nutrition, which is I said it's fine, but 
I mean, we got by people eating berries and sticks, you know, yeah. <laughs> indigenous people for thousands of years. So it's like, you don't need to pump in 4,000 calories. And I'm a little yeah. dude, so yeah, the odds of me burning 4,000 calories a day is slim at best. You know? That's definitely uh, personal. Everyone's body's so different. You know, the first year I packed in, uh, it was a little over 2,000 calories, and it I felt good, but I lost a lot of weight yeah. over seven days. And so I upped it a little bit. I didn't want to go yeah. too heavy on it, so I, I went a little bit closer to 3,000, right around 3,000 calories. And for me, that felt good. You know, mm. and I, I felt really good on it and dialed with it. But like you, like you said, honestly, you can get by with – whatever yep. you're going to do it but it, it takes some time to feel your body out and and certain foods will make you feel better yes. and um and i you know what i, what I uh I, I read i forget what i read but the guy was like whatever you plan on eating out there eat it for like a week straight at a time mm -hmm. you know like a month or two and, and get see how your body like I said you know, the cramps the bloating or anything that you might not want to have out there last thing you want to do is be you don't have the worst stomach pains in the world where you're on an elk, you know, and you worry about crap in your pants. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, and, it, and if it can happen, it will happen yeah, exactly. there, you know. Yeah, and uh, so that's what I did. I got my body used to eating you know, the dried fruit, dehydrated fruit, and come to find out I like some things a lot better, like apricots. They they gave me energy, and they, yeah. they sat with me well. Oatmeal, powdered milk, skim milk, um, and blue, dry blueberries. That was, I mean, I could eat that up. All day, every day. That's a, yeah. You know, I I still eat that now. Actually, ever since that trip, I eat it. I eat that just water, uh, powdered milk, and oatmeal almost every morning. And like so my wife's like, "How's like? I like it. it tastes good." Yeah. She goes, "But there's milk there." I was like, "But this is gonna go bad." It's powder. She goes, "It's powdered milk. It don't go bad." I was like, "Yes, it will." <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Just leave me alone. Let me eat my uh, my little breakfast concoction. Yeah, that's that's hilarious. And yeah, I I had food seemed to be have a pretty decent impact on my body it's just i i'm sensitive to foods and then maybe that just shows my personality well, <laughs> well also too we you know, like we were we touched base so much on different things last night but it, it you just have to try different things because yeah. what works for you might not work for me like rick and i we're completely different he's huge full of muscles i'm not and our food is definitely different yeah you know our, the but you and he's been doing it, bodybuilding stuff like that, so he knows his body very well. You mm -hmm. know, like I don't really, I'll, I'll go without, I'll go out half a day without eating. I don't care. You know, I'm not trying to maintain muscle. Sometimes yeah. I don't feel like eating. You know, so you know, going up to that trip, there was definitely uh, a learning experience with the diet aspect. Because yeah. the last thing I want to do is not have enough, and I didn't want to ask Rick for food because it probably would have got ugly. <laughs> <laughs> you and, uh, and you didn't we want seen, to give up his food, huh? Yeah, we seen two grouse. We we're like, yeah, we're hungry. We'll, we'll shoot a grouse. People are telling me there's grouse everywhere. We seen two in six days. They're not everywhere. They might be everywhere, but where we were, <laughs> <laughs> I, I had the same experience. I've heard on some other podcasts and stuff. Oh, yeah, you can shoot grouse. You know, they're everywhere. They're great eating, and, and I agree, they're great eating. But uh, I couldn't find them. Like I think I flushed one out, yeah. and they were, it was giant. It was like size of a turkey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> big mountain grouse. Yeah. <laughs> but it, uh, it, yeah, that was, it was funny to. But even the, the one grouse, literally, I, I had to kick out of my way. We were running out of water. It was one of them hot days, and both of us were getting moody. I was getting a headache because I had no water. Yeah, and we dipped down one valley. I was like, man, I hope there's water here. And Rick is like. I hope so too. And it's like, if not, we got a long way up, a bunch of blowdowns. We found the old cattle trough, you know, that yeah. still pumping, and it was going in. So we we filled that up, and uh, like we come out of there, uh, Ricky ended up, you know, uh, dropping something in his packs. So we had to backtrack, so we're both kind of just irritable. And this thing's grouse in front of me. He's like, well, I'm, I'm kicking, just, just get out of my way, and I'm kicking it. And it's like, it won't leave. And I'm just like, get away from me. And I was like, Rick's like, what are you doing? I was like, it's stupid grouse. He's like, well, kill it. And I was like, just. I was just wanted to be out of this valley. I just wanted to go back up to my tent and take a nap, you know. I was just so, uh, you know, it was just the heat and no water. And that's a water thing, too. It was just you consume massive amounts of water. Yeah. Like we're taking water runs. You know, and, like, next time I'll camp closer to water. That's for sure. Yes. I'd rather go up, you know, the, the chase elk, but at least have water near my camp. Uh, that's a big, you know, lesson learned the hard way. Cause yeah. Especially with dehydrated foods and oatmeal, stuff like you need water every meal. You have, you need water, you have, and you're consuming it because you're sweating it out. Your food's consuming it, and it's like 
wow, you know, like it's a gallon and a half a day probably we were. Oh, yeah. Yeah, minimum. You know, gallon and a half, two gallons. Oh, yeah. You could never have enough water, it seems like, and it weighs so much. Oh, gosh. And, and you're packing, you know, <laughs> when you're packing in with all your other stuff, yeah. your camping gear and, and your bow. But the thing that, that I learned, same thing as we camped up on a ridge. You had to drop down to get water. And if you got up there and either forgot to get water or somehow ended up on that ridge again, you had to go back down and back up at the end of the day. It is, it is the, it's like the most mentally draining thought, (laughs) you know, of doing it. And it it takes a lot to to make you do it. And it's just so, uh, you know, especially with the altitude, us, like us, you know, flatlanders here on the East Coast, you know, just that altitude change, you know, and even 4,000 feet, we feel it, you know, because we're not 4,000 feet. But lack of water and high altitude, for me, it's like instantaneous headache, like a debilitating, I'm popping three Tylenol, you know, 500s, and I need to lay down for like, you know, a half hour in the shade because it's just like you can't think, you can't see. And then, you know, we, you out there, you, the last thing you want to do is make mistakes, get hurt, you know, cut yourself by, you know, it, who knows, you know, so it's like water, camp, <laughs> water definitely needs to be near my camp next time. You know, 2019, where there's water, that's where I'll be. That's where the camp will be. <laughs> that was good for taking a bath, you know, like just cleaning up, you know? Yeah. Because uh, that was just a, a, another brutal aspect of it. You know, just no place to take a shower, even just in the creek. Like, we were just near little springs of water. And, you know, just trying to, like, take bird baths is, and sometimes you want to just jump in a water, you know? Yeah. Just jump in a giant ice glacial pool, but all we have was cattle mud puddles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I tried filtering some pretty disgusting water out of an elk wallow out yeah. there. When, <sighs> this this past year, there wasn't as much water as there was the, the previous year, and uh, I took that for granted. And, you know, I've, I've been warned by it. I've heard it on other podcasts. I've read about it, and other people that have went out there said, you got to make sure there's water. I'm like, well, there was last year, you know. there's There was water everywhere. It wasn't the same case, so I ended up, you know, filtering – you know, out of a, a wallow, and I'll tell you what, I mean, filtered elk piss is still elk piss. You yeah. Know? It might yeah. might be clean, but it's, Pretty much. <laughs> it's, 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 it still tastes the same. Yeah. And and, uh, <laughs> and the fil- filtration systems, you know, we had the, the bladder with the little screw in. Yeah. Like they, they were great because they packed down, you're not using them. Um, and the bottles, they, I had this one rubberized, like, filter bottle, garbage. You know, it wasn't fitting the thing, and then you couldn't get out, and then you couldn't really get a full 16 ounces because the way the filter thing was like, man, or 18 ounces, whatever. You know, you get like nine ounces out of it because the filter's so big, it takes up the thing. You're like, this is stupid. But it's like all I had to drink water out of. So I'm like, yeah. Well, so I'm filling it up for like two swigs. And so I'm like, well, that's a dumb idea. Whoever thought of that is not a very smart man <laughs> and or woman. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my my filter experience, I had one of the inline gravity fed filters and it didn't like real dirty water like that. It plugged up quite a bit and I, I kept, uh, I tried backflowing it and it would work for a little bit, but actually we had two of those there that failed during the trip between the, the other guys that I was hunting with. And, um, and luckily I brought back up, you know, uh, Aquamira tablets, yep. part A and part B. The only thing there was as far as getting particulates in there. But there's there's ways of getting around that. Yep. Even putting your T-shirt over yep. can help. And they make little screens for Nalgene bottles on that. But I uh, that that was a that was a big thing that 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 I noticed last year was if you're going to be filtering less than you know clean water, yep. um, that may not be the best option for you. And you like know? I said, we had the tablets. We had the like what's. Uh, was it iodine too? Was it the iodine? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Was, uh, we got a water uh, purifying thing from you know, it's an EMS or one of them REIs. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, we had that backup. Both of us, you know, had different filter systems for water and mm-hmm. like the backup. So that's a that's a definite plus. That like I said, if you really, you all have the same filter, you like I said in those cartridges. I mean, I've used them in the gap, and they, you know, in the spring they can you, know, you get a lot of runoff, a lot of leaves, debris, mm-hmm. and you know, you, you just you get water, it just takes forever to drain out, and you're just like, oh, come on. You know, and you said it backflowing all the stuff, it don't fucking work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it doesn't work. Yeah. So, um, so anyways, and enough a little bit, uh, the, the Western <laughs> trip there, and what, you know, that we don't know very yeah. well. <laughs> Which know, is a lot. <laughs> try, try, trying to learn that, but... Let's go back to your bread and butter, whitetails. Yes. That's what that's what you cut your teeth on, isn't it? Love it. Uh, yeah, it's, I was 
My first deer I ever killed was a buck. Killed him on my birthday and a piece of public that Rick and I scouted mm-hmm. all summer long. We hung her, you know, you know, we were talking about last night, the hanging hunts and the running guns. Yeah. You know, no, just purple tree stands people to stop, to stop with it. Uh, <laughs> but we, you know, we go out that day, you know, had the screwing steps, which we shouldn't have had screwing steps, but when you're 14, 15, you don't really understand rules or why yeah. things are put into place. So we, I, you know, put the stand up and shot my first deer, five point buck on my birthday, my 15th birthday. It was, uh, pretty, pretty awesome actually you know yeah. shot him my dad told us to wait till the morning because he was working and uh he ended up shooting him right in the neck i was only, i was aiming for you know here and end up i guess he turned or heard me move or i don't even know i was yeah I remember just shaking like a leaf yeah i couldn't even pull my bow back just that you know he's like 15 yards and i'm shooting him right in the juggler vein and he ran like 60 yards yeah it was a, such a cool experience and that year rick killed his first buck you know first year was a buck you know on uh halloween that same year so it was uh it was pretty gnarly. Yeah. You know? And just been hooked on ever since, you know. I'm mainly all public. I mean, I got a few pieces of private I have access to or permission to hunt. I rarely hunt them. Mm-hmm. Like we were saying last night, the, the guys that hunt it aren't very nice. And there's just a lot of, there's more pressure on 500 acres sometimes than there is on, you know, 1,000 acres of public. You know, because four-wheelers, you know, and here in, I mean, Jersey, we got, you know, bait hunting is, makes it. A difficult task, even more difficult sometimes. Yeah. Because uh, the food, you know, they can just change. Uh, you know, some people, you know, the does are, they bet off the bait piles, you know, and that makes it things, because you don't know somebody put bait there. So you're going in, you're blowing out there in the morning, you're like, wow, that stinks. Or blown, blown out walking out, but you didn't even know somebody had a bait pile there. Yep. No, that's, that's definitely, you know, in Pennsylvania, we're not allowed to bait. So that's a little bit different there. But, Still have the same type of people as far as what you're encountering. It litters, littering, which I can't stand. Yes. Like, you, you, you're obviously riding your four-wheeler back to your stand, you know, on public, which I find comical. Um, and you can't even take your own trash out with you. you. Like, you have a vehicle. Just take it with you. Yeah. So, whenever I find that stuff, I gather it all up and I put it in their stand or I'll take some rope I got and I'll hang it, like, wind chimes off their ladder stands. So oh, yeah. They come in there, you know, they got good stuff going on yeah and it's just a little a little bit to add to that even you know i know we'll go down a rabbit hole yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh ohio if you've ever hunted ohio i don't know what it is and i'm sorry if i'm offending anybody from ohio <laughs> but the public lands are littered with trash it seems like southern ohio is all bush light northern ohio they like they like pepsi you yeah know? I, I, don't, I don't know but um, it, it, it it's just it's disgusting. Yeah. So and we're and we're supposed to be with some of the uh the conser- leading conservation conservationists, I guess, mm-hmm. for wildlife or fish. And hunters and fishermen, I find, can be some of the most repulsive human beings I've ever met. Yeah. Um, it's disgusting. It it shames the whole you know, it shames everything. You know the people involved. Like I, I follow the rules, like you follow the rules. But yeah, you know this guy out there is with a son teaching him bad things. Your son picks up on that his son, and it's just you know it's just terrible. You know, just pick up your mess. You know, and treat everything like it's your house. Yeah, because it really is. I mean, you you technically bought it if it's public land. You bought it. Yep. All your license fees. You know, you you own it. Like yep. take care of it. Exactly. It could disappear, and then you're going to be the first one crying and complaining that it disappeared. Yep, and there's no opportunities to Exactly. Hunt. So what would, what would you think if you're looking, um, I guess if you're looking for a, a solution, to, and maybe a solution is not you know, the, the best word to use, but a way to, to start taking that and, and moving it in the right direction, or maybe it is, but from your mind, what, what would you do to help change that, to help the, the new hunters coming up, you know, follow more of a conservation mind? I know when I took my hunting test, it was very hands-on. You had to go somewhere, read a book, and now everything's done online with, it seems to be everything. We're instant this, instant that, or maybe not enough people are getting involved. You know, maybe I'm at fault for not getting involved or yeah. do- donating my time, you know, giving my, because when I took my test, like you went there two or three days at a, at an archery place mm-hmm. and they went through everything. They had different speakers. You learned how to track blood and you shoot. Now it's all done online, which your dad can take the course for you. Your mom can take the course for you and pass it. You go there, you shoot three out of five hours and pay play, and there's your hunting license. You're out the door. Yeah. And I don't think that's very good. And maybe the states are strapped with cash or however it might be. 
but if states would get involved on the you know the the ground level and not maybe not even states just people need to take ownership us fellow hunters you know yeah. uh because i mean i got a, a stepdaughter and, and a daughter on the way and i'll be darned if they're going to learn things or, or do things that are unacceptable when it comes to you know being outside littering or, or just you know because i'll take i'll pre- be proactive because they're my they're my kids yeah but maybe we should be all be a little more proactive on things that not directly we benefit from. Yeah. Know? No, I know. I, I get completely what you're saying. And I, I went through the same hunter safety course as yep. you did a few day thing. It was a, it was a, it was a, a big, big deal. Thing. Yeah. You know, I went with my dad and we went there and we sat down through it and it was extremely helpful and taught you how to be respectful, how to handle, you know, weapons safely, how to do everything. And, as far as management, how to, you know, where to shoot a deer at, you know, where are the vitals at. Went through everything and you can click through slides and stuff. Now, I've never went through the online course. So I'm not going to speak of what yeah. exactly it has, but I, I just think that hands on experience and that really, you know, having that, that role model or mentor mm-hmm. to be able to, to help you through that and, and, uh, go forward. Like, like you said, though, sometimes it comes down from the parents and that's, yeah. that's tough. Yeah. And, um, it's not all hunters are like that. You know, I've met some amazing people, um, that, that are hunters and strong and conservationists. I would just like to see like, like you're saying, um, that change a little bit as far as, as a whole. So we don't, we, because you know, one bad egg can put a, you know, a dark cloud over the whole industry real quick. Yep. And like my dad is an outdoorsman and they're actually from out Johnstown. My dad's family's from out this way. They grew up old coal miners that their their dad were coal miners, Mm -hmm. but he had nine brothers and sisters, and he was youngest, so his you know oldest brother was you know pretty much raised him, and he was real strict. I remember as a kid going like taking you know go shoot guns with him. He was super strict, like scary, like I don't know shoot with guns. Like he yeah. was like six to eight, you know, old mil- military, you know, but great guy, and I miss him dearly. I didn't appreciate him when he was around, you know, mm-hmm. but now he's not around. He's like. Man, I kind of missed the boat on that one. There's a wealth of knowledge and stuff you could have learned from. Yeah. But he was real strict with gun safety and, and you things the right way, you know, the safe way. You know, you don't take bad shots. You don't take shots quarter and torch. You know, you don't you do not do things uh, just to do things when it comes to, you know, taking the life of an animal. Mm-hmm. You know, and he was big on guns. Like, I watched him bust 100 clays, you know, 100 in a row like it's nothing. And it's like, he goes, because that's discipline. Because he's a bird hunter. He's big time. He travel all over the country bird hunting. He goes... Well, when I make a shot on a bird, I want it to die. I don't want to hit it and it flutters away or I don't find it because that's not how it's supposed to be because you're killing for food. You're not killing for sport. Like hunting's not a sport, you know. Here's another rabbit hole thing we're going, but, yeah. you know, hunting's not a sport. Taking the life of an animal is not a sport. It's not a game. You know, it, it, it is real deal, you know, killing something is important. you got to take it serious. You know, that's how people for thousands of years supply food forever to their family. You know, that's how they lived. Now we're kind of lucky we go to a grocery store, you know, buy food or borrow some meat from somebody. Yeah. Nobody's ever really going to starve, you know, if you're, you know, in somewhat of a modern society, I guess. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, I think if people took hunting, you know, and killing, you know, hunting is killing, but you take it to the level that it needs to be. Put it on that level of respect. You know, it's not a game. It's not a game of inches like we were talking last night. It's not how many inches your deer was or anything like that. You know, like killing is... You know, it's serious business, you know? Yeah. You know, ask the Marine, Marines to tell you, killing serious business, you know? We, <laughs> you know, because, you know, uh, you want that animal to die quick and fast. Yep. And you need to teach the, the younger generation the same thing because we're t- we're letting the, the new hunters or the hunters that don't maybe have a mentor, if TV shows our mentor or a TV personality, we're in trouble. Yeah. I mean, serious trouble. And that scares me because now I, now I got kids, you know, 10 years ago, didn't bother me because I know now I got kids. I'm like, man, this is important. I need to be a little more proactive. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I joined a few archery you know, related things in my state to make sure my archery hunting voice is heard, you know. Yeah. But it's hard to be involved on a level because work, school, family. Yeah. And hats off to those guys that make it happen. Definitely. You know? And and the best you can do is just when, when you talk to people is try to set a good example and like when, you know, I, I work at an archery shop part-time, Bucks and Bows Archery, and down there we have kids come in, and I really try to spend time with them when they come in, 
you know, talking them through it, you know, yeah. asking it, you know, if they're interested in hunting or if it's just archery yeah. and then trying to, you know, just, just maybe one little thing can get them to stick, you know, exactly. stick in their mind and, and help. And every little bit counts, you know, no one person is going to be able to change, you know, the entire industry like yes. that. But, you know, a lot of people with little inputs can help. Yes. And, uh, you said, and it, it, it's just getting people to, you know, a lot of people when it comes to the hunting, they, they, they're hunting now, like hunting's the cool thing to do. Yeah. And that's scary because I come from like the snowboarding world where when I first started snowboarding, it wasn't the cool thing to do. And then it became cool. And like, well, not, it gets like oversaturated, like people kind of losing that, that sport for it. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess skating had the same thing. I didn't skate, but I guess everything has that when it's kind of more underground, less, you don't have to worry too much. When things become mainstream, you get outside people in that might not know the, the real ins and outs of things. You can really set yourself up for some trouble for a lot of people. And even the industry as a whole. And I hate calling it the industry. Oh, it sounds so cliche. Yeah. The I industry. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, no, I, I, I completely, you know, understand you know, what you're saying there, and especially with social media now, mm-hmm. it's it's a blessing and it's a curse. You know, I, I love it. I mean, I wouldn't have, you know, met you or anybody else that, that's here a lot through that without social media, but it's opening the floodgates to eyes that have never seen hunting before and, you know, hunting practices and dead animals. Mm-hmm. And if you, you get that stuff in the wrong audience, it, it, can, it can turn on you. Yeah, and the, the censorship that social media is... There's a lot of censorship now on social media uh, about people killing and stuff, you mm-hmm. know, because there's a lot of anti-hunters that aren't down with it, and they have money and power. Old, old, like, there's new world money, and then there's old world money, and some of these people got old world money. You know, that money goes back thousands of years. That's power, and that's dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> that's dangerous. Um, but, yeah, like I said, social media can be good if it's with anything. Like, you have to go in with an open mind, you know, and... You have to set a good example with your pictures. You have to be clean, tasteful. You know what you, you don't disrespect the animal. Don't lay down next to it half naked or all them weird things that people seem to be doing now. Like you know, clean the you know, clean the blood off. Take I mean that's that picture first of all is you. That moment's captured forever. Take care of it because when you're gone, that picture's the only thing left. That mount you know if you got it mounted, that might be long gone. You know, destroyed in a fire or something. But your your pictures, you know, a hundred years from now, that picture says you were here and you. You, you did something pretty amazing. Yeah. Like, clean it up. Make it look good. You know? You know, like, I, I people that rush, uh, rush their pictures or, you know, it's unclean, unsanitary pictures. Like, I get it. Like, you know, blood is involved. But, you know, clean up a little bit, you know? Yeah, you know, because you're speaking for, you know, everybody, you know? You know, good pictures that promotes good good stuff, you know? You put you put out good product, you're going to get good return. You know, you put out, you know, shit product, you're going to get shit return. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's, it's as simple yeah. as that, right? <laughs> so, um, switching gears a little bit, let's go back to your style of hunting with whitetails. And again, like you said, the, it seems like, I guess, your, your own style that you've had for a while now has become a little bit more publicized yeah. and, you yeah. know, the thing to do nowadays. But explain a little bit about that and, and kind of the different terrain you hunt. From the sounds of it, you hunt all over yeah. and whatever you know it's just my uh my goal as a, as a hunter was to be a complete hunter so i hunt in every like new jersey is a great state because we have it all we got salt marshes you know pine barrens big woods all the way up to you know the mountains so you can really hunt a lot of different terrain and i my goal was to hunt all that terrain and kill you know mature deer you know maybe not you know you know necessarily pope and young caliber but mature deer so you know, I've accomplished that at this present moment. I've killed deer in every different terrain New Jersey's had. The big woods, pine barrens, salt marsh, swamps, you know, uh, mountains. Yep. So, but my style of hunting is, is you know, is the, the in thing now is you have bed hunting. And I remember in 93, Roger Raglan's invading big buck bedding areas. And that video has stuck with me forever, ever since I watched it, because He'd be on the ground, you know, hunting bedding, bedrooms because I never had much luck hunting food. I still don't. I try it, and it's always, I'm like, meh, you know. Yeah. Because deer will, eat, they will literally eat a stick, you know, if they're hungry. They're like, oh, and that they stick do. looks good. Yep. Mm. 
I know there's danger over there. So I'm going to eat this stick till it's dark, and then I'll go over there and eat. You know, I, I don't have much luck hunting outside of bedrooms, be it doe or, or buck. Mm-hmm. And as I've, you know, social media aspect, I ran into Dan, you know, and his method of actually hunting a specific bed. And I took what I learned, you know, the last, you know, 20 years or so and mixed it with Dan stuff and really come up with something that works, you know. You know, specific bed hunting does work. It's lonely hunting. It's extremely lonely because if that deer is not better than that bed, you're not seeing a deer. Yeah. <laughs> you're not even going to see a, a, you know, a ear, tail, nothing. But when it comes together, it's a it's a beautiful sight, you know? I, I mean, I couldn't tell by your shirt that you were into buck beds. Yeah. Hashtag buck beds matter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just made these up. <laughs> are those your own shirts? Uh, yeah. That's awesome. That's, That's awesome. My, my little logo I made up years ago. I was like, oh, I get to use it now. That's hilarious. Yeah. I like it. I like it. But, um, so that, that's what's interesting to me is, but what you were talking about with all those different areas you list, listed off, you're finding that just in your home state in New Jersey. Yes. And almost every state has different type of areas like that. You know, Pennsylvania. So where I grew up is in more of the mountainous terrain. You can go a little bit, you know, west, you might get in more big woods, but not as much mountains. And then you get into swamps and farm country and suburban hunting. And there's all these different things. And that just shows like, the, the adventure aspect of the Eastern hunters, you can find some amazing experiences when you when you come up with goals like that and, and try yep. to go outside your comfort zone. Exactly. Is it going to be easy? No, but it, it's fun. Yes. Like it's addicting. When, when I, I, that's my goal. Like I look at just, I mean, outside of looking at big game stuff, but just whitetail specifically, I have so many things written down that I yep. wanted to do. <laughs> I, what's great about whitetail they're everywhere almost every state has yeah. a, a form of a deer be it mule deer or whatever so that it's amazing creature a very adaptable creature they're not like, unit specific you know mm-hmm. they're like mountain goats or rams you know elk's got a pretty wide terrain but like there's they're everywhere they're literally everywhere so and there's big deer everywhere but you have to also have to keep your um goals in check of where you're hunting you know if you if you want to shoot a hundred range deer you might shoot one in Pennsylvania, but odds are you won't. You know, mm-hmm. so lower the bar. You know, aim for mature deer. You know, aim for a deer that's three and a half, four and a half, because that's something most people dream about. You know, to kill a four and a half year old deer in public or even private's hard to do. They're just a different monster. But the people just set goals that are actually attainable for their state and you know, and bump them up a little bit. You know, I'm like, all right, you know, I shot a, a six pointer last. You know, I've shot a half dozen six pointers. You what? Make it. You know, go. You know, you might eat a tag or a tag or two for a year or two, but you probably you know, will. <laughs> yep, yep. Bump it up a little bit because that's yeah. how you're going to learn and grow, and that those experiences can transcend to other areas you hunt. Like me, not shooting a deer for I didn't shoot a buck for, for three or four years, and it was such a growth experience because I was hungry. Yeah. So I read everything I could. You know, I learned everything I could because like not killing sucks like really bad like i shot a boatload of does like i you know, got meat in the freezer but i was like i'm not even seeing bucks and it's like but i'm gonna keep staying the course i'm gonna keep staying the course yeah and then once that you know found out that little magic formula for me like i'm a morning bed hunter which goes against a lot of a lot of people's stuff but it seemed to work for me and it was like boom and i can make it work you know and i, I have had other people you know i tell them my ways and it makes it work so it's you find what works for you. You adapt many different styles to make it your own style. Like, don't imitate, you know, if we hunt together, if I imitate you, neither of us are going to grow because I'm just following you, you know? Like, you got your own methods. I got my methods, you know? So learn from you know, a giant pool and then start doing your own style, you know? And you'll find what works. You know, you throw enough, you know, so the saying, you throw enough shit against the wall, something's bound to stick, you yeah. know? <laughs> you know, and... uh that's all you got to do and just be you. So many people want to be something that they're not or somebody that they're not. Like, I'm never going to be Dan Info. I'm never going to be Adam Hayes. I'm, not, I'm, I'm Greg Litzinger. Yeah. So you, I, I want to be the best Greg Litzinger. So I learn from these guys. All right, this guy works for this guy. I'll try it. If it don't work, up, on to the next. Yeah. You know? and, you, and you'll find that after a while, you, little bits and pieces, like you become all these people. Like, you know, like everybody becomes you know, you 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 meant you you follow somebody you learn from him you know you take a little bit here you know a little bit from this guy a little bit from this guy and next thing you know you're like wow this is actually working out for me you know yeah. i'm having success and you created your own person yeah you know, your own yep. your own hunter personality yep. you know and no that's that's awesome that's awesome stuff there because like you said sometimes you you get caught up and you read something or you watch something and you just 
go full bore trying to be like this person. Okay, well, let's look at it. What's what's applicable to you from this that you might be able to try to help you and see how it fits into your own game and uh, and roll with it. And, but definitely be open-minded enough yeah, to... And it's area-specific, too. Like, a lot of techniques are area-specific. You know, what works in, you know, Iowa, they ain't going to work here in Jersey. Yeah. You know, uh, even the public land in Iowa, you know, I got buddies that live out there. And they're like, dude, if you lived out here, you'd kill giant deer. Just because you understand deer level that most people just choose not to, either out of ignorance or, or the laziness. Like, I read, 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 read. I mean, I got a, a bookcase just full of books. I mean, I got books on, on whitetail. Like, I'll say, I buy, you know, TV personality books, you know? Yeah. You know, I'm not going to mention names, but... <laughs> People <laughs> might make fun of me, but the I can learn stuff from them, yeah. you know. Or get these older books. You know, I got an old book on from Greg Miller, uh, uh, Big Woods Rub Lines or Big Woods Rubs or something. Such a good book, you know. It's written in the, the mid '80s. You know, a lot of those old time books. Like that's where you're going to find knowledge. A lot of newer books is it's not. It's a food plot, land management, you know, trail camera setup. But you need to get away from all of that and go back to the beginning, you know. Like, I grew up with, you know, in the era of Miles Keller. You know, he's not the same Miles Keller as he was back then. He's running some problems, I guess, you know, in his personal life. But he was a giant deer-killing machine because he eat, breathe, sleep whitetails. Yep. Like, Roger Raglan, you know, and uh, just all these cool, you know, guys that were true hunters before the popularity. They didn't do it to be cool. They didn't do it for money. You know, they were professional hunters that were probably damn near broke back in the 80s, you know, because there was no money in it, you know. Now it's a billion dollar, there's that word again, industry. Ugh. Yeah. yeah. It's a billion dollar thing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't but, know. I guess industry, uh, industry sounds a little bit better than thing. <laughs> it's this billion dollar thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, read some older books. You know, there's a lot of knowledge out there. Um, get off social media sometimes and read a good old book from the 70s or 80s. About just behavior. Yeah. And, and, and woodsmanship. Yes. And, and well, like you said, to, to kind of bring that all together is by you going around and hunting these different places and these different, um, well, they're the same animal, but almost not, you know, you know, they they act so much different sometimes in, in places, but you, you become a better person and hunter altogether by just pulling bits and pieces. And you, what's not necessarily like so many people are, are you know, I'm speaking from a, a target, you know, archer world. Uh, so outcome oriented, they're worried about where the arrow is hitting. Not worry about the process to get the arrow to hit. Same with hunting. There's people to worry about, you know, that deer in the wall or the inches of antler. You know, it's the process to get that deer is what, you know, is where it's at. You know, because once you do that process a few times, you can take that anywhere in the country and have success on any animal. You know, like I said, well, Montana, we're covering up elk all week long. Never seen elk in, in the wild before and one of heavy pressure, heavy hunted areas and we were covering up an elk. Not too bad for guys that never stepped foot in that place before. Yeah. And that just comes from me hunting a lot of different terrain, you know, understanding how animals move. You know, they're, they're very slick and they're all the same, you know. And I don't care if it's an elk or you know, a bear. They're going to use terrain. They're going to eat certain foods and move certain times, moons, all that stuff. So, you know, and that just comes from learning, trying to learn. Yeah, and, and you can't try to learn without putting yourself out there and giving it a shot. Yep. And you know, there's there's so many places like – you can, I'm sure, Cole, you work a full-time job and everything, you know, you have to go to on a weekend trip. If you want it bad enough, you can make it happen. Here's every one of my six mature deer I've killed, mm -hmm. Saturday mornings. Yeah. Saturday mornings from 7 to 7.30. Wow. Yeah. I've killed one, no, i say I killed one deer in the evening, one mature deer in the evening. Out of all the deer, I'm a morning guy. Yeah. You know, my first deer was in the evening, and I've only killed maybe five, less than five deer in the evening. Morning, morning buck beds matter. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> morning beds matter. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's just, you know, and that goes against a lot of what people think in the heavily hunted areas. Yeah. But it just seems to work for me. I, I, I make it work for me. Maybe because I put effort into making it work, you know. Or maybe I just like getting up at 3 a.m. like an idiot yeah. for some strange reason. Or, yeah, or getting up at 1 and driving two or three hours to the mountains. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the hike, you know, two miles in to... Not see a deer <laughs> for three years, you know. So, but yeah, just people need to just find what works for them, you know. And what works for me probably won't work for a lot of people because yeah. I'm, I'm stubborn. I will make it work at time, you know. I think that's my greatest asset, you know, and probably downfall. 
is I'm stubborn. Like, I'll wait it out. I'll mm-hmm. put that time in. You know, and a lot of guys were, won't. You know, and then I'll put time in areas that I probably shouldn't put time in. But I'm like, it could pay off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Well, hey, Greg, I think uh, we've been on here for a little over an hour now. Right. And I know that you have to head back to yeah. New Jersey. And why is that? My wife's about ready to give birth to my little daughter. So she's uh, a week out, less than a week out. She was kind enough to let me come out here last night and today. So she's pretty awesome. That's that's exciting. So yeah. that's I that's go. important enough to leave Total Archery Challenge yeah. a little early, I would exactly. say. Exactly. <laughs> you know, she's uh, I'll be first time dad at 40 so it's a whole new world for me i'm stepdad now but having your own blood is i think a little different yeah you know uh so it'll be fun i'm not a little hunter though no. my stepdaughter she loves shooting bows finding sheds she gets she goes out scouting with me loves shooting the bow yeah can't wait to she's like greg 10 i can kill deer right and i was like yes you can kill deer at 10 all right you know i'm six so that's like four more years i was like <laughs> yes Claire. no she's like 10 I was like, "Yep, that's that's it." So that's it. I'll have a little hunting partner here shortly. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. So good luck to you with that. But uh, first, so where can anybody find you and any stuff that you're, you know, you're messing around with? Uh, Instagram, Bow Hunt Fiend. YouTube, Bow Hunt Fiend. Um, uh, if you check out, if you, know, I'm a, you know, I shoot new breed bows, uh, titanium archery stabilizers. Uh, radical archery designs, peeps, broadheads, good, uh, good stuff there. Yeah. You know? Uh, 60 X strings. I mean, you know, they, uh, pretty good strings. Awesome. So, um, what kind of content can, can people expect from you on there? Real, real. <laughs> Ain't period. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is end of story. Uh, uh, I'm not going to BS you. I, I show the bad along with the good. Yeah. Uh, you know, like we did a, me and Rick did a 3d shoot the other, uh, last saturday and perfect setup 53 yard deer he filmed me i was like it's 53 yards shot eight inches over back and i i put it on there people are like i can't believe you put that on there I'm like that's what happened you know like why can i put that on there yeah. i always put the good stuff that i'm just a guy putting good stuff i'm like nobody's perfect all the time i don't care who you are or what professional athlete you're gonna strike out you're gonna miss targets that's just the way it is you know i'll awesome. put it out there and tell how it is you know and that's a topic for another day but um I, you know, strongly recommend anyone that's, you know, using social media and stuff like that. That That's a good laugh regardless. To, to go through it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You might feel good about yourself reading some of my posts like, mm, glad I'm not that guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if you're having a bad day, yes. follow <laughs> Bo But anyways, Greg, I really appreciate you yeah, coming on awesome. here. And it was uh, great meeting you and talking to you. So we're going to be uh, doing some doing uh, some more talking here soon, sure. I'm sure. So, All right. Uh, enjoy. Uh, maybe shoot tomorrow, huh? Yeah, I'm hoping uh, yeah. hoping to get out of the booth and shoot yeah. a little bit. But um, they, get a, they get a six a, six a.m. shuttle. I don't know, but I, I'm gonna try. <laughs> All right, man. We'll right, man. Uh, we'll talk to you later. All right, cool. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.